Thank you for joining us for the District 9 Town Hall. Um, just a few housekeeping um, things. The, the restrooms are down the hall, are out this door and to the left if anybody needs them. Um, we do have some handouts on the back table, including a list of all the bond projects that we're going to be talking about tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about two different subjects, the um, proposed projects for the bond election and the proposed budget for 2022. So um, we'll have staff come up and do a presentation and then open it up for questions. We are recording this so that anyone who wasn't able to join us tonight would be able to watch it online. So um, if the person taking the question could repeat it so that we can hear it for the, for the video. And now I'm gonna invite Council Member Beck up here to welcome everybody. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. And thank you for taking the time to be engaged and learn about um, what we're doing here in your community and providing that valuable input uh, because you know best what you need. And so I appreciate you coming out and taking the opportunity to learn more and ask questions. And if there's anything that my office can ever do to assist you in any issues, if your, um, if your water main breaks and it floods your backyard, Catherine, um, <laughs> <laughs> feel free to uh, always reach out and email us at district9 at fortworthtexas.gov and we will make sure that we do everything we can to, um, to answer your questions and be as responsive as we can because it is really my goal to make sure that this district works for you and that this city works for you. Um, and so with that, I will hand it over to who's first? Steve Cook is first. Good evening, everybody. I'm Steve Cook. Um, I work in the property management department. We do facility, we construct them, and we maintain them. We do the fleet in the city, and we do real estate transactions for the city. So I have a cursory uh, involvement with a lot of these, with these bond things, the facility side of it mostly. So I will try to talk as fast as I can. There's a lot of, there's a lot of slides. There's a lot of information. We'll try to make this not be just a, a total drudgery. You have to listen to this accent for half an hour. I apologize for that. Um, I'm from Amarillo, so it's a factory install. I can't help it. Um, so I'll, I'll try to go and I'll try to keep on my notes so we can go as quick as we can, okay? So, so when we start, start talking about these goals, obviously we, um, we want to maintain what we have, and that's not, that's not like street maintenance. That's like picking up McCart Street and putting it back down, okay? When we talk talking about maintaining stuff, stuff like we'll talk about in the, in the, in the Botanic Gardens, it's a, replacing a building or something like that, okay? So maintain what we have and make keep it beautiful and keep it nice. That's what we're talking about. And these growth areas, we obviously have a ton of growth going on in Fort Worth right now. We all know that. And so we want to maintain the services that we can there when, when, when possible. And we have active transportation corridors where we have a lot of pedestrians and buses and cars going up and down there. So we want to keep everybody safe and the bicycle. So that's, that's, that's another goal we try to hit when we go to us and allow for partnership opportunities. That's a big one for this year. I'll explain why in a minute, but we have some major partnership things that we need to talk about that are really, really big for the city and great for the city. So we'll, we'll talk about that as we go. And also equity at the end of the very top one. Equity is a new, a new one for us, and we'll talk about that and why we did that. And there's some, some places in here where we'll talk about it and show it. So it's a big deal for us this year, too. Hey. Um, our, so one of our strategies that we go with is this capital delivery. We're going to spend about $30 million bucks before we even get started on any of the transportation and things. We try to do some, some, some initial alignments with some of the roadways that we're working on, and we try to get some idea of what the, what the utility may be out there. We don't want to say we're going to go build a brand new road and we go out there and we find out there's a duct for, for phone lines this, this wide that we have to replace and cross five times and not plan for it. So we spend a little bit of that money to get ahead of that. We also do that to help us understand what the right of way is going to be. We buy the right of way in my division. And so oftentimes we can, we can move an alignment around so we don't have to, to buy somebody's whole entire front yard and possibly just buy a little sliver of it. Okay. So there's a lot of that we do at the beginning. So we know what's going on. And then right down there, program highlights. If you look at that, leverage that $213 million, that's one of the opportunities I was talking about for partnerships. When um, the county is going to have a bond election this year, too, and it's going to be about $400 million. And the reason why we're doing the timing we're doing now and calling for this election when we're trying to call for it is we're trying to talk with them about um, throwing in money with us so that we can take the dollars that we're trying to propose and add it to their dollars and have, have even a bigger program. So. $213 million of what we're talking about today is going to be uh, money that we're asking for others to, to come, come in with us, okay? 
Another one big deal for the equity piece of it for about $230 million of this falls within districts that are majority minority and super majority minority areas. And so I'll have some maps and things that we'll show. You can see how that lines up as we go through this, okay? Oh, this is a, another slide that I thought was taken out of mine, but that's okay. The, the, bond, the, the genius that's gonna come up here and talk about the budget stuff can probably explain this way better than I can, but essentially how this works is we have a certain amount that we spend on debt in the city. It's just a, it's, it's this much, and so when we, do a new, when we do a new bond, we borrow up to that level, and then we start paying it off, and then we do another bond, and we borrow up to that level, and then we start paying it off. So that's when we say there's no tax increase. That's what we mean, because we're not gonna go over that part, because if we went over that part, we'd have to identify funding but we don't do that. So that's how we can say that there's no, there's no extra money coming out for the taxes on this. This is pretty much a daily and operational thing that we do every day of our lives. So um, we started the data collection when we start talking about doing these projects. We've been doing this for a year and a half just for bonds, but we do this every single day. We have master plans and strategic goals that we all have to, that we've been initiated and that we have to follow as a department. So everybody in every department, the city manager makes us do all those things. So this is just something we do all the time when we, we, we follow the development trends and where they're going. Obviously, we, up, we know way up north, there's tons of development, right? So that's not a hard trend to follow. <laughs> so we, can, we, we do that and we, we talk to council and we talk to all these people. And we, we look at service demands and all the things that we're trying to do, our boards and commissions, and we go to neighborhood meetings and we hear from you guys. So this is how we've developed this project going on for the last 18 months, okay? And here's a, one of the things that we do. We have the departments, and, and the department, we're talking about fire, library, police, whomever, we ask them to submit their greatest needs. So they submit to us, um, to the people who are doing the bond planning, their, their projects of greatest need. And there's not anything that really was given to us that wasn't something that's a really an honest to goodness need. And some of the projects we're doing in 2022 were 18 needs that we couldn't get to but we put them on the 22, so it's a big deal, and um, I just don't want you to think that it's some, oh, this would be nice to have. These are things like roads <laughs> and sidewalk projects and a community center in a place where a community center that there is 50 years old, right? So this is all big time stuff. So that we have a committee that that goes to, and we all try to prioritize it because we are resource constrained. We can't just build everything that we want to because we talked about that, you know, keeping within that um, certain amount of money, right? And so we have to, we have to make, decide what our priorities are. So we have objectives that we go through and do that. So we take that through the city manager's office, then we go through your council representatives and we go to public meetings with guys like you all to tell us what you think and what's going on, right? So this is kind of something that we just continuously do, especially, and we concentrate on it when we're gonna do something like a bond program. These are, the, these are some of the objectives we were talking about and how we prioritize all these projects. Uh, we talked about that we being a new, new criterion and the Racing Culture Task Force that we got some uh, recommendations about three years ago, and one of them was to be more effective in terms of um, using your bond dollars to go in other go, in, go into these super majority minority areas and the majority minority areas. And so we've taken all these things that we've done and we've applied that, that filter to what we're doing so that we make sure that that's what's going on, okay? So you'll see that as we go by. When you start talking about improving exist existing infrastructure, think about an intersection. So there may be a great roadway that's doing great, but you get to the intersection and every intersection's backed up. So when we wanna improve existing inter infrastructure, what we're talking about doing is making that, inter that intersection work properly. And like federal and state requirements, that's ADA. So we need to do ADA stuff on sidewalks and roads and buildings, okay? So that's how that's, we go through all these things and we kind of prioritize which projects get, go up to the top, okay? So that's the super majority minority areas and the majority minority areas in, in the city. And so when I throw up a, a map here in a minute that talk, talks about transportation stuff, you're gonna throw this up afterwards and so you'll see how it applies to that, okay? So every time I talk about a, a process or a program, we'll have some of these things so that you can see it and so you understand what, how, how it applies to this new, this new thing that we're trying to accomplish, okay? So the initial needs that we got from everybody when they showed up, when we got from all the departments, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on the slide, I just want you to look at that giant number. It was $1.3 billion was the initial needed needs, needs that we got back from all the departments so that we could start analyzing it, okay? We're not gonna do 1.3 billion because we'd have to go up on taxes to do it. So we have to, we have to winnow it down. And so we winnow it down to $500 million, okay? And so 64% of that is streets and transportation, 17% is parks, so essentially 81% of what we're, we're proposing that we do is, is transportation and parks related. 
for the for this project, okay? And just so you know, anybody that left your email um, with Michelle in the back, she'll email you all these present this presentation so you can have it and you can study it and look at it, okay? You don't have to kill yourself trying to see it because I move kind of fast sometimes. So anyway, just so you know, you can get it. You can get a copy of it. Uh, also, we have a new new category at the very bottom there, uh, open space. We haven't never done that before, and that's a new thing for the city. We have these corridors and these places that are these pristine things that have some kind of cool feature about them, and we don't want somebody to just come in there and take all the trees out and build whatever on it. We want to protect it. So there's another thing that we're doing that that's kind of a new thing for this year, too. So this is the streets. This is mostly the transportation stuff, as we talked about it. You can see on, on here, over on the left those little key areas when I talked about new improvements. And we'll talk about it. I'll, I'll have a list of a lot of the stuff so you can look at it. We're just trying to show you how it spreads out across the city. So a lot of the arterial works, the blue lines, arterial work, you can see that's way up north, right? That makes sense because that's where we need to get people moving, of course. And then you talk about the neighborhood streets, it's over in the older neighborhoods, right? Because we don't need to build neighborhood streets where the developers have built all brand new streets, but we do when they built these streets in the 1940s. So if you just kind of look at that, you can see that that's kind of the spread and the balancing act that we, we try to take when we're trying to do all these things. And that's the same exact information spread across the the majority minority areas as we talked about earlier, just so you can kind of see how that, that plays out across the city, all right? And this is the listing, and this is the part where I'll talk about the, the, the cool partnership part opportunities that we're gonna try to seek this year. So we have 11 arterials, we have bridge rehabilitation, we have stuff for traffic signals, sidewalks, all of those things, you can read them out right there on the side, but if you get down to the bottom of it, essentially what we're suggesting for this bond is 320, million dollars for transportation needs across the city, right? So the cool part about that is if you look right next to that, we got $200 million that we're requesting from the bond program from Tarrant County. Now, I haven't approved that yet, but that's the request that we've made. And so we're trying to leverage those funds from them. And we're also using impact fees and other things, almost another a little over 50 million bucks to add to it. So ultimately our $320 million ask or proposed Transportation turns into a $570 million program is what we're trying to do. And that's why the timing is so important for us to be here now so that when Tarrant County does their bond, we can ask for their money too, all right? So that's what this all boils down to ultimately. And then when we talked about our goals being, trans our being partnership opportunities, this is what we're talking about right here, okay? This is obviously the arterials we talked about. If you look over on the far left-hand side, that's the council district where they belong. Seven is the one far north, the northwest, where it's so congested. And you can see there's an awful lot of those are going on. And you know, out of 11 of them, there's six or six of them are in council district seven. And there are other ones are spread out all over the place. So um, I know that this I'm going kind of fast, but there's people here from Transportation and Public Works that can answer any of your questions when you get done with this. If you have specific questions about how far it's going or where it's going to be or all those kinds of things, there's people here to answer those questions, okay? Another thing is these corridor supporting transit. So if you look at these, these are very established corridors throughout the city, okay? The top one on Lancaster, well, what that is is when I talked earlier about we have these places where we have tons of cars and tons of people walking, people on bikes, we have people trying to catch a bus, and bus stops and all those things. These are things we're trying to put together in those areas so that we can keep them as safe as we possibly can. So we're trying to find a, a local match with 10 million bucks for Lancaster. And so if we found somebody like Trinity Metro who had another 10 million, maybe we could make that into a $20 million program. We hadn't done that yet, but those are the kind of things we're trying to do in these particular areas because there is so much congestion with pedestrians and things like that. So we wanna make those safer. And then he, when we talked about intersection improvements, when I showed you that one map, it had the little red crosses on it. These are the intersection improvements. And of course, those are scattered out all over the place, but a lot of those are in the central and southern parts of this town where it's a lot older. So we may have some corridors that are working pretty well, except for those intersections. So what we're trying to do is have a way to improve those intersections that'll improve the whole thing. So that's part of what we're doing with. So this is obviously not way up north like the arterials, but it's all over the rest of the city where we've kind of established thoroughfares and collectors and things of that nature. And then uh, <clears throat> this is a really cool one. There's a, you can see a ton of marks all over the place. What we have, we function with here at the city, we asked the council about three years ago if we could go to what we call a zero, uh, a vision zero process or program. And what that means is we don't wanna have any more deaths on our infrastructure elements within this city, right? 
And so that was a, <clears throat> it was a big deal. The council said, of course, we want to do that too. So in order to do that, we've got to throw some money at some of these places so that we can make them safer. So a lot of what we're talking about, it may be as simple as striping. It may be a, a, an enhanced crosswalk. It may be a bump out to make people slow down with just striping. It may be curbs to do that. It does, it, there's a, there's a, and it, it's a lot of it's technology for, for pedestrians and it's technology for tra tra um, signal timing so that we can keep people safe, right? So there's a ton of different things that this really involves, but it, a little bit of money will go a long way on them, so that's why there's so much of it that's marked, okay? And one of the key elements about the equity piece, when people ask me, why are you doing that? Well, if you look down at that one, 79% of our high injury network fall within or are adjacent to the super majority minority areas, 100% <clears throat> of the pedestrian deaths, 47 of them, and two of the, two of the bicycle deaths were in super majority minority areas. We've got to make that not be the case anymore. It's Vision Zero is attacking that. That's the whole point of it, is to get rid of those kinds of things, keep those from happening, okay? So that's, a, that's the important part about this, that, that while we're, that's one of the equity reasons why we're doing what we're doing, okay? And this are the top 10 stinkers. We'll just call them, like, these are the places where we've had the most um, injuries and deaths. Everything that has a star beside it, that, that would indicate that there's been a fatality in that area. So these are the top 10 ones. And so those are the ones where we throw a lot of money and a lot of effort into to make sure that we can get, keep that from happening any longer, right? So this is a big deal, and this is one of the ones we're excited about. We, we, and one of the ones that means the most to us because we really can see the effect on this real quick. So <clears throat> there's $5 million just to address these, these, these kinds of things. That's enough about transportation. We'll start talking about parks and recreation, okay? <laughs> So this obviously is a map of the whole city, and these are those dots and pictures and things just kind of show you where all the places are that we're trying to do different things for the Parks Department. And there's people here from the Parks Department. There's a couple here. So whatever I do that I mess this up and don't answer, you can't answer your question, they're gonna be here to be able to give you the specifics and tell you everything you'd ever wanna know about it, okay? Just so you know. So that's where how that lays out on the super majority minority areas and the majority minority areas. So that's how that kind of how that pans out, just so you know. And these are the proposed projects. I would again, it, it's $87 million. The bottom line down there, $87 million. Bucks. This is a big program for parks. I think one of the last two that we did, they only got like $14 million. Bucks. So this is a big deal for parks. It's a big year for parks, which is great, obviously. But I'd call your attention to these middles. There again, <clears throat> we're, trying to, we're trying to get some partnership dollars from other people to spend on our projects so we can leverage the money that we're spending with other people's money and make it even better. So instead of us getting a $13.5 million project, we end up with a $23.3 million project. And that's in just one park. <clears throat> but it's not quite as significant as we're getting for the transportation dollars, but it's still something we're trying to do. We're still trying to leverage those dollars any way we can so we can make this program as, as good as we can, right? So <clears throat> we'll start talking about the specific park ones just like I did for the, for the, for the streets. The Botanic Gardens is $4.6 million proposal for that one. You know, all, you all know that that's a jewel of the city. We love that place and we want to keep it that way. Some of the facilities there are pretty rough shape. Some of the infrastructure there is in pretty rough shape. It was put in 50, 60 years ago in some instances. So it obviously needs to be, if we want that place, to, if we want to have a Botanic Garden, we want it to be beautiful, we got we to gotta commit to doing something with it. And so that's what we're proposing to do with that. Heritage Park and, and, and um, Paddock Park is something, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Heritage Park, probably not. It's been closed down for years. It's a beautiful park right there at the front door of the city, right just, just north of the, um, of the courthouse. It's incredible. It, it was designed by some famous architect, and the problem was it had all this lighting and drainage and, and water features, and they, none of them ever worked together very well, so it's kind of sitting there doing nothing now. So we're proposing we spend some money on that to make it where it actually functions and have that beautiful park back. Second of all, is right in front of that courthouse, we have a big, beautiful park that would be like the welcome, it's the, it's the front door of the city. And we want it to be beautiful and welcome, welcoming to everybody that comes up that way. And so that's what that's all about. The Fort Worth Water Gardens, again, it's the same thing. Um, that place was obviously constructed a very, very long time ago, and there's a lot of piping and a lot of pumping and a lot of uh, wiring and different things that aren't functioning the way that you would expect it to. If you take your aunt and your uncle and your cousin to come to visit Fort Worth and they go out there and you look at the water gardens and there's no water in it, what's the point, right? And so if we're gonna have the water gardens and we're gonna treat it like something we love, then let's, let's do so and make it work and make it function and be something like you'd expect for it to be. Again, on, <clears throat> this is the places where we're gonna do some drainage and erosion control in our parks. 
oftentimes in parks, we have water features. We have ponds, we have creeks, we have meandering little river things and drainage areas, honestly, in those. A lot of times when we buy a park, it's in the flooded areas, so the, the developers get the high dry land and then we get the leftover stuff that's got the drainage in it. It makes it for real, to be real pretty, but oftentimes we didn't have the, the money to address these erosion, erosion problems the way that we wanted to. And so this is what we're proposing to do. We solve a bunch of erosion problems. It keeps us, keeps everybody safe in a park. We want that water to be where that water's supposed to be. We don't want it washing out trails. We don't want it washing out bridges. We want it to be where we want it to be. We also want to be a good neighbor. We don't want to have our water running off on our adjacent neighbors and we don't want to have it shooting through our, our park going 100 miles an hour and going ruining something somebody's life downstream, right? So a big part of this is to make that all function right, look right, and be something again that you're proud of when you go to your parks. Um, Meadowbrook Golf Course and Sycamore Park improvements. I'm gonna start with Sycamore Park. Sycamore Park, that used to be a golf course. We worked with the, um, we worked with the, the neighborhood, we engaged with them, not unlike what we're doing here, and said, hey, this is a golf course that nobody's using anymore. It's not getting a lot of attention in terms of golf, and then nobody else was using it for anything else either because it was a golf course, right? We asked them, and engaged with the neighborhoods and said, hey, would you like for this to be a park instead of a golf course? We're not getting any revenue out of it much anyway, so what do you think? They all thought that was a great idea, so about three years ago, that's what we did. We made it a park. Unfortunately, we've never had the money to make it a park. It still looks like a golf course, and it functions like a golf course. Essentially, when you walk, walk through it, well, I'm walking around on a golf course. What this money would do is make it a park, a real park, places to park and things to do and different kinds of facilities and trails that aren't just like a cart trail, that they go all over the place and do all kinds of neat things, right? So Sycamore Park, what that amounts to is changing an old golf course that nobody was using to a real park. And it's really kind of cool because it's, it's obviously as a golf course, it's huge, it's kind of neat. Meadowbrook Golf Course was kind of a different thing. That was actually getting used. People were, were getting revenue from that. And it's, yeah, it, it's getting run down and it's getting worn out. We're kind of getting it loved to death but people were actually using it. So it was kind of a, it's one of those things we say, well, if we're kind of like the water garden and botanic garden and all those other things we're talking about, if we're gonna have it and we're gonna make it, we're gonna say we got a golf course, well, let's treat it right and do something nice with it. And when I had everybody think about what we did for Rock Creek, um, is it Rock Creek? Rockwood. Rockwood Golf Course about six years ago, Parks identified some funding. It was a cool, it's a really cool, um, golf course, but it was getting loved to death. It was worn out. So they spent a bunch of money and made that golf course pretty awesome. And we saw a big spike in use. So in the 18 bond election, we decided we would try to put a new clubhouse out there too. The one that they had looked like an old pizza hut. It was awful. It was the worst thing you've ever seen. So we went ahead and said, let's, let's do that in 18 bond election. So we did. It passed. Thank you all for voting for that. And it passed. And we just opened it up in April and we've seen another spike in use. Rockwood has changed. Is that right? Rockwood has changed from a love to death, not unlike Meadowbrook, to this really cool place that people you would be proud of. You, everybody in the city would be proud of that place. The clubhouse is great, and the golf course is great. So we want to kind of start that with Meadowbrook and see what happens with it. Let's, let's put some money into it and make it better and see what happens with it too. Kind of the same concept. Um, park, we're still in parks. It's a long, I told you, they got a lot of money this year. <coughs> we, got two, we got two pools plan for this year. We have one for the Stop 6 um, neighborhood. What, what is really cool about that, if you, any of you know the Cavill projects, the housing projects that were there built in the 40s, that all got torn down. It's, not, it's no longer there. We've taken, we were, those families have been placed in other places. <clears throat> so we have empty land there, the Fort Worth Housing, uh, Fort Worth housing Authority owns it. They're gonna donate the land to us, to us for us to build a community center out there, which we, I'll talk about in a minute. That's another part of the deal and put a pool out there. So we're gonna put a community center where there's no projects used to be. And we're gonna put a pool out there too for the kids to learn how to swim and do things. And so that's kind of a cool thing for Stop Six. They don't have that now, so it's kind of neat. Um, forest Park pool replacement, it's the same, um, same kind of pool that we're talking about putting there. This is actually the same kind of pool we put in Marine. If anybody's familiar with Marine Park Pool, we put one there. And if anybody's familiar with the McDonald, what's it called, McDonald YMCA, that was, a, that was a dual thing between us and the YMCA. We put one at Marine Creek, or Marine Park, McDonald, we have one, we're, we're, and we're proposing the same, the same thing for these two places too, just so you know. Forest Park is one that was built in 1921. It was refurbished in about 67. It's very old, so yeah, it's time for something new. So those are those pools. Um, 
so Echo, Echo Lake Park was a county park. The county had this park for years. <clears throat> I don't know how long they had it, but they had it forever. It really didn't look like a park. It certainly didn't look like a city park. It had a couple of backstops and a trash can and a bench here and there. It was pretty rough. So what we got it about three years ago from the, from the county, and we wanted to make it, this is the first time we've had a chance, so we put it in the bond election so we can make it a park, make it like a city park and make it a real park. So we're talking about making that from nothing against the county, but that's not what the county does. They're not great at doing things with parks, but we, we have a bunch that does that, so we want to make that into a real park. Um, Gateway Park is also, it's kind of like the same philosophy we've talked about with Meadowbrook and the Botanic and the Water Gardens. Gateway, Gateway Park is an incredible facility and if we keep, keep doing new things and making it better, it'll even be more, more of an amazing place. So what we want to do is engage with the, with the neighborhoods and everybody around the city, because everybody in the city uses Gateway, and say, hey, what do you think? What, what, would, what would you like to see out there? And so we want to we make it better and cool, but we want to be the kind of things that you all are really interested in having out there. So that's why we put, it could have these things. We don't know for sure yet, but we want to we put some money into that place and continue to make it as, as cool as it is now, or even cooler. Neighborhood park improvements in a lot of areas, we have, we have a hunk of land that we, were gonna, we, we bought so it can be a park, but we haven't done anything with it in terms of having a parking lot or having a picnic table or having a shelter or having a playground or anything else. They're just kind of a wide spot. So what these, these dollars would do is turn all those, all those hunks of land into parks, real parks like you'd recognize and see and you'd want to go play in, okay? The Fort Worth Zoo, part of our, part of our deal is we own, we own the land and the buildings out there at the zoo. They have, we have a lease agreement with them, okay? And so when they want to do improvements, when they want to in, in make things, put in a new whatever, put in a new facility, a new building, a new cage or something, any utilities that need to go out there, we're on the hook because it's our land to make sure they get the utilities. It's part of our lease too. We get the utilities to them so that they can do that. So they have plans to do some improvements, make some improvements. There's utility requirements for that to occur. So this is for us to do those, to do those utility improvements so that they can make those, make those improvements. Trail gap connections. We had a lot of success on the 18 program doing the same thing. We took the same amount of money, if I'm not mistaken, for the 18 program, and we took a bunch of really cool segments that we have with the trails that go from River Legacy Park all the way to Lake Benbrook, and we were able to connect a bunch of them. We want to do the same thing again and keep bringing that all together so that we have one interconnected, really cool trail that goes from city limit line to city limit line. And this will help us get us there. It won't do it completely, but it'll certainly help us get us there. So, and like I said, the parks guys are here. They can tell you and give you some more, you know, you know, particulars about that if you want them. Open space. So, is anybody here from open space? I'll have to try to answer those questions. I hate to, I hate to tell you that, but um, open space is a new program. And so, it's, what it's done is, we talked about it a little bit earlier. We're taking these, these places. Um, Broadcast Hill was one. It's a beautiful, pristine place. It's up on a big, giant hill, and nobody was... It was kind of for sale. There wasn't a lot of interest, but what were they going to do with it? And we didn't know. So we went and got it, and we bought it, and we're going to hold on to it. And we're not making it in the park. We're not doing anything with it. We're making it open space. We don't know what we're going to do with it in the future. But what we know is we want to have some control over what does happen in that future. So that's what we've done. And that's what, that's what open space is all about, is giving us the places where if there's something like that, we can get a hold of it and make sure whatever happens is something like all of us can be proud of, OK? So facility improvements. In the last 14 and 18, we, my, my department, which is we're the ones who build stuff, we've got about 100 million bucks and we built 10 or 11 facilities. And this one, we only get, we only get in six facilities. So it's a little different. We, we were able to catch up on the last two, so we're not doing as many this time, right? So this is, this is, what, this is kind of what happens when you start catching up a little bit. So this is, a really, this is a kind of a good news story, honestly. But that's how it lays out across the city. And that's how it lays out across the majority minority areas. So everybody knows. Um, we'll talk about all of these. It's pretty much a $77 million project or program for us to build a bunch of new facilities. And some of them are growth areas, some are replacements. We'll show you. So the library system, this is far northwest um, part of town out in Council District 7. In that particular area, within three miles of the place where we've identified, 3,900 people moved there this year. Not this decade, this year we've had 3,900 people move into that area. In the last five years, 30,000 people have moved into that area, okay? This place is exploding. It's just absolutely blowing up. And so they don't have a library and they need one. The closest one is Golden Triangle, which is on the other side of 35 and it takes about 20 minutes to get there. So this is obviously, a, as, a, as we are growing, we're gonna have to have services for these people 
in these areas that grow. So this is how we identified that, and this is where we're going. Um, fire safety improvements, we have two replacements this year. We've been building new ones across different parts of the city because of places where we're growing, north and south and all around, we've, we've been building new ones. But in this one, for this particular pro bond program, we're just doing replacements. Fire Station 37 was a temporary station that was built in 1998. I'll enforce, reinforce temporary. <laughs> it's supposed to be three to five years. It's 23 years later and they're still in a portable building. It's pretty ridiculous, and so we need to get that replaced and place it with a real fire station just like we build for everything else, okay? So that's, that's enough explanation for that one. Fire station number 16 is out off Camp Bowie Boulevard. It was built 55 years ago. It's the bay doors on it are so low, we have to lower the suspension on the fire trucks to get in and out the doors. There's no co-ed facilities. We have a lot of female firemen now. There's no co-ed facilities. Obviously, 24-7 use, 55 years. You can imagine what, it, what, it, what it's kind of gone through in the last several years. Um, it's, it's showing its age and we want to replace it. We don't need to, we're not going to do anything special, but just take that one away and put a new one there, okay? So that's a replacement. Community center, so we, we talked about in the stop six area putting that pool. So it's the same, this is, a, this is a community center that would go right there beside it. So this is a community center in the old Cavill projects area. Those have all been torn down. So we're getting some, the, we're get, the, getting the land donated and we're gonna put a big community center there. It's a huge 28,000 square foot community center. It's just like the one at Como, not just like it, but an awful lot like the one we just put in Como in the last bond election. Thank you again. So we were able to do that and for Como. It's a beautiful place and this will be a beautiful place too. It's gonna have a place for social services. It's gonna have a library in it. It's gonna be really an incredible facility. Plus with that pool, you just take a neighborhood that, can you imagine having a projects there and that's gone? and having a community center and a pool there now. It's just, it's pretty cool. Fire Station Community Center is um, a replacement as well. Uh, somebody in the 80s thought it was a great idea to take an old fire station that was built in 1937 or so and stick a gym on the back of it when the fire department couldn't use it anymore. And so it's been there for about 40 years. It's showing a little bit of its age too. It never has functioned really like a community center. Thank goodness for the, the community loves it and they've used it like crazy, but it's really, it's kind of functionally obsolete. It's pretty much completely functionally obsolete because when it was constructed, it was kind of ill-conceived, honestly. So what this would do is we leave the fire station facade and anything that's historical, we leave it there, make, keep it, make it beautiful, and build a community center around it. So that's what we're proposing to do for this one. The neighborhood loves that community center, but we're gonna make them a better one and make them one that they can actually, it's actually functional and does what we want it to do. You can have real programming in there for seniors and youth and everything else, okay? So because what we have to, kind of doesn't work that way. And then police improvements. This is the last facility, I promise. Y'all get tired, y'all getting glazed over. So um, this is the last one. So if you'll think about where Meacham Airport is, on the western edge of, of, of Meacham Airport, there's a, uh, there's a big vacant piece of land. We've already bought that, we own it. And what we're proposing to do is put a police station out there for Northwest Patrol. They're currently in two places. They're in a, they're in a leased facility off, out by Meacham Airport. It costs $150,000 a year. And then they're also in a building that was built in 55. It's right there at Northside Drive. It's, you talk about obsolete. I mean, it's a 24 hour facility that it should, it should have been torn down 25 years ago. So anyway, what we're doing, talking about doing here is putting a real honest to goodness facility out there, Northwest Patrol. We built this North Patrol right up here with, a, with, with money about, about when I got here, about 2016. And we we're building this one down south. We just built that, that's from the 18 bond election. We're building that right now. It's currently under construction. So we've had a lot of, lot of really good success in, in um, getting for police and facilities, getting them out of leases and some other things like that so that we can have, do things that make a little more sense, okay? And then that's it for my part of it, except we'll have a few questions. Um, so you find yourself in the public meeting phase. That's where you're at right now. That's what we're doing. Well, we're, we've been validating what we've been hearing during our meetings from other people and saying, you know, getting, taking your input and doing, seeing, seeing what all that looks like and what that means to us. We're gonna finalize these meetings in October. The council has to call the election in January, February in order to have an election in May. So the Tarrant County is gonna have their election in November and hopefully by the time they do that, we'll know the answer to how much they're gonna let us le leverage with them. And so we'll have that answer so that we'll know what's going on. So then the, obviously the bond election would be in May of, of, this, of next year. And with that, um, I can answer a couple of questions, but if you have specifics, 
Um, it might be better till we get to the very end. Um, and so do you want to do the bond or you want to come talk to us first, Mr. Pick? So we can let Miss Lorraine's going to come talk to you. <laughs> Okay, before I pull the presentation up, I, I wanna thank Lorraine for um, doing tonight's budget presentation. She found out at three o'clock that she would be doing it because of a family emergency with another staff member. And um, so she's been frantically looking over the slides. So um, I, I really appreciate her stepping in and doing this tonight because you didn't want me to do the budget. So the first thing we want to talk about is property values. And when we talk about property values, we're talking about the appraised value, which is equivalent to the market value of your home. And then we're talking about net taxable value. So if you own a home and you get a homeowner's exemption, that, that is your net, ta net taxable value. Um, and as you can see, we've been growing significantly over the last eight years. As long as I've been at the city in 2007, we've been growing. Um, and I'll point out on the net taxable value, because we're going to see these numbers come up on the next slide, is on net taxable, you'll see in FY21, our net taxable value was $79 billion, and we go up to 87 in 22. So I point that out so you can see what this looks like and how we get from 21 to 22 and how those values, we arrive at those. So we started 21 with $79 billion. We had what we call change in existing value of 5.3% or $4.2 billion. That means basically that overall average existing property in the city of Fort Worth increased 5.3% average. Um, and then we also added $3.2 billion in new construction or 4.1%, which gets us to the $87 billion current taxable value in the city. So those healthy values that we have have allowed us to decrease our recommended tax rate from 74 and three quarter cents to 73.25 cents, or we dropped it a penny and a half. So when we talk about the property tax rate, um, from a statewide level, you're talking about two components. You've got O&M, your operations and maintenance, and you have INS, or debt, interest in sinking. And so we split our rates into that, and that's what we report on. If you go onto our website and you look at some of our calculations, you're going to see those two rates split out. So we lowered our operations and maintenance rate, and our debt rate is currently 14.75 cents per $100 of value. Um, the city further separates out the operations and maintenance into pure operations and capital or pay as you go. Um, and so we set aside a portion of our tax rate to pay for all the infrastructure needs th throughout the city, which include park maintenance, transportation, things such as that. This chart um, gives you some historical context for those tax rates. And you'll see that, you know, over the last 10 years or so, we've been able to lower our tax rate significantly from 85 and a half cents down to our current recommendation of 73 cents. Um, we add the bottom portion here to show that you know, we're maintaining um, our, our commitment to pay-go, which is pay-as-you-go capital, and to debt. And it just tells you the percentage of the whole. So that's, and how those rates allocate out over the years. So taking some of those different factors, you can see that we have a taxable value of $87 billion. And when you apply that tax rate, it's going to net us revenue of $596 million. So, and you can see all those percentages are a little different. So while value is up 9.4%, the ability to lower our tax rate 
has allowed us to, instead of having a 9.4% increase overall, it's 7%. And then this is how, when those various rates applied to value, what dollars are going to each component. So, and then it's a year-over-year a year change. So you can see that this year for the O&M rate, which was the 52 cents, that's gonna generate $421 million of revenue, which is a $26 million increase over last year. So that's kind of how to look at this chart. Um, Pago, we kept the rate the same at six and a half cents, and that's generating $4.4 million additional for the Pago, the cap, that pay-as-you-go capital investment. We've also been able to set aside basically the equivalent of a quarter of a cent for economic development to for cash incentives, um, economic incentives as we go forward. And that a lot of that was in our um, economic master plan that they came out with not too long ago. Um, and then debt increased, even though we lowered the rate slightly, it's 14 and three quarter cents, it's generating about $6.4 million additional revenue. So this slide is to kind of give you an idea of how the various changes in taxes impact you. So we're going to make an assumption that house value is $200,000. And if you'll recall, we had a 5.3% increase in existing value. So now, based on that, the new value of your house is $210,000. So, and then we were able to lower the rate a penny and a half. And so you can see the revenue that's generated on each one of those. So in FY21, it generated $14.95 in city taxes. And in 22, it generates $1,543 in city taxes. So it's a slight change for the five and a half, for the 5.3% but with lowering the tax rate. If you were to take the numbers and just apply the 5.3, it would, it would be a, obviously a higher number. Um, and if you wanna see how that pans out for the various components, there's your overall $1,500. So $1,200 of your taxes to the city are going to operation maintenance, 311 to debt. And then of the M&O, it goes 1,000 operations and 137 to the capital infrastructure. So now we're gonna switch to the recommended budget. And so the total operating budget is $1.8 billion, 1.9. And of that, 40% is the general fund, which houses your basic operations, your administrative functions, safety. Then we have the enterprise funds, which make up 33%. Those are our water, storm water, solid waste, environmental, parking. I'm sure I missed someone's. Um, and we have special revenue funds, such as the CCPD or the Culture and Tourism Fund. Internal service funds are our fleet maintenance, there are um, risk management funds, so those type of funds, obviously debt service funds, and then our fiduciary funds, which are trust funds set up for some of our um, a health benefits. Our general fund revenues, as you can see, are 80% are from property tax and sales tax. Everything else makes up that remaining 20%. And so this is just another way to look at this with a comparison from last year and the increases or decreases to each of those categories of revenue year over year. And then expenditures for the general fund. This is by department. These are all the departments that make up the general fund. This is in descending order by um, dollar amount. And you can see the comparison from their budget in 21 to what they have in 22, what's being recommended. Um, 
some of the big drivers you'll see for economic development. Um, we have some contractual obligations for economic incentives that impacted that, plus the $2 million we talked about earlier for um, economic development throughout the city. Non-departmental has some increases related to because um, for the new city hall that will be, in, we've set aside some dollars for that. And then here's, here's some of the other main drivers overall. We have a pension contribution of 3.6 million, that's additional. We have fire wage collective bargaining, which is 4.9 million. New facilities, 5.1 million, so that's new facilities that are opening and operating for a full year or for part of the year. We have police and wage meet and confer um, benefits, 7.2 million. Pay for performance, 7.4 million. And again, the economic and development incentives is 11.6 million. Just real quickly, the enterprise funds, $631 million. Water, which is a regional um, facility, is the majority, along with solid waste, stormwater, our municipal airports, and parking. And with regard to enterprise funds, there were no rate, retail water or sewer rate increase, increases, no residential solid waste collection fee increases, no stormwater fee increases this year, no parking fee increases this year. So those are all good things. Special revenue funds are $173 million. You can see that this is CCPD, makes up the majority of that, which is funded through a quarter um, cent of the sales tax. Culture and tourism is following up with, and the remainder of these special revenue funds that we work with. And so the CIP, we've talked about that a little bit. We develop a, an annual five-year plan with current investment and then um, what we think our future needs are going to be. So we have six plans. We have aviation, public events, general fund, which includes all the general fund departments, solid waste, stormwater, water, all have capital plans. Our investment this year it's 442 million, or for 22. And then some of the things that we're paying for with the pay-as-you-go funding this year, that six and a half cents, is street maintenance, traffic system maintenance, neighborhood improvement strategies, park maintenance, bridge maintenance, sidewalks, and street lighting in the majority minority areas. And then we've recently gotten some updated numbers on population, and this is a per capita. Our new population for 2020 is 918,000. Um, and it's just a comparison of growth of our tax revenue and how that looks. So next steps. So these town hall meetings are going to continue. Um, there's several more this week. I think maybe there may be one next week. On September 14th, we'll be having a public hearing on the budget and a public hearing on the tax rate with anticipated adoption of both of those things on September 21st. And then here's the dates of the meetings, and again, you will all get a copy of this if you're interested in attending. And that is as far as I'm going. And I will tell you, if you go to the budget, uh, if you go to the city's website, go to the budget page, scroll down, there's a whole section on truth and taxation. Um, if you have questions about it, you can um, email us at taxes, T-A-X-E-S, at fortworthtexas.gov. And so you can ask any questions you want. There um, are sites for the appraisal districts and also for the websites where you can go put in your address and it'll show you all your tax rates 
from all the taxing entities that impact you. But there's a lot of information on that page about budgets. There are um, PowerPoint presentations. There's all kinds of documentation that you might find useful and interesting. So. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, now, Councilmember Beck's going to come up here and um, field questions. Just a reminder, if you'd like copies of the presentations, be sure you um, fill out the um, sign-in sheet and provide your email. Okay, so who's got questions about what they heard tonight? Yes, sir. I want to back up. I apologize for not catching this to begin with. I want to back up to Street Park and the Road where there was uh, infrastructure funding and there were extensions and there was other extensions. Could I, could I just hear what she said again about that? About the infrastructure and roadway expenses? The distinction shown between infrastructure and something else. And by the time I wrote about infrastructure, the rest of come back. There you go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, Jazz, what was your question? You wanted to know what the distinction between the two is? Okay. Jazz, I don't think I understand your question. She was so dividing it down into priorities or classifications. And we reached a point where it's infrastructure and something else. And I didn't catch what, this, what the other thing was that it was being distinguished from. Maybe debt and operations? The tax rate and the breakdown between debt service, oh, okay. O and M, and how much we dedicate O and M towards okay. payo cap. Is that your question? Because this is this is pay rates. This isn't an, an allocation of infrastructure versus. Can I see that part? No. <laughs> <laughs> So, operations maintenance, which then gets split further into oh, okay. operations and then capital, which is paid. If, you know, if we could answer that from the microphone, just so the folks, yes. I appreciate that. So the question was, I know you can't see this from here, but it was, it was the split of the, as Richard said, thank you, Richard, um, the way that the city splits um, operation money, because the state, if you look at, again, if you look at tax rates and the way we calculate them, you're going to see on anything from the state, you're going to see debt and O&M, right? And so the city further distinguishes between our O&M rate, because we want citizens to know that we're committing to, you know, infrastructure, pay as you go, keeping, maintaining the current infrastructure that we have. So what we do is we take our O&M rate and we further divide it between operations and capital, also called pay-as-you-go, investment in infrastructure. It, all those things are sort of interchangeable. So that's what they do with the O&M portion, is they, they take a portion and put it on operations, and they take a piece of it and commit it to uh, pay-as-you-go infrastructure annually. Does that help? Make sense? Uh, is, this, is this a general question now? Are we, are we a general question? Yes. Okay. Uh, I've got two more sort of congruent or sort of uh, pursuant to that. Uh, who's, who's got charge of the alley? Is it? Neighborhood services or alleys? Alleys? Neighborhood services. Neighborhood services. Okay. Yes. Uh, is there any source of information where I could find out on a book? First, is now block by block, and then how is the block designated? How much coordination does neighborhood services do with code as far as dumping on a regular basis? In other words, is there any attempt to build a dossier or a uh, history of alley block, block by block? Uh, as far as the location, uh, how often this is done. Uh, about six years ago, I was told, this is back when uh, 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 
great might have had it. And I was told it was this rather nebulous committee. It was made up from uh, mostly police and some code society. The president's on heaven island maintenance. And who, who decides that now? Who decides who gets alley maintenance? Yeah, and the, the frequency, uh, what is the criteria for coming back and doing it again? As far as uh, uh, cleaning up, uh, how much of it goes beyond just killing vegetation for uh, out vegetation for the time being? So to answer your legal dumping question, um, that's an initiative that you're gonna see citywide. There's been a, um, an emphasis placed on abating and stopping illegal dumping, not just in our alleyways, but um, in, on certain thoroughfares and um, across the city and abandoned uh, lots and whatnot. So that is an issue that we've identified and that we're working on to, to help remedy. Uh, and to, to go on and just finish answering your question so that we can get on to other folks. Uh, you also have, any time that you have an alleyway question, please, again, feel free to reach out and, and contact the office, and we'll get out there. Neighborhood Services works really closely with code to identify issues um, in areas that need assistance, whether it be mowing maintenance or illegal dumping, uh, illegal dumping, uh, clean up and then they do keep track of where they go and they also keep track of how much uh, they have picked up in the form of refuse when they when they go do one of those cleanups and so if you have a question about a specific alley or block we'd be happy to get that info to you okay, that's what you know, uh, I've got another subject on behalf of somebody else I don't mean to hog the whole week here but there were promises made on the gates and the barriers by uh, uh, TNT that they would be maintained, and this crack is not being done. Is this in the Worth Heights area? Uh, actually, it's JMS Alec, maybe Worth Heights too. They, I believe they order them. Okay. So we've actually looked into that, and those gates and barriers were part of a grant program that the city received several years ago, and um, we are looking to repair and replace them. It's just not part of our regular maintenance because they were part of that grant program when they were installed. So any other questions? Hollis. Um, yes. What the park department calls an enhanced aquatic facility, at Marine Park, it's essentially a splash pad. Um, I'm involved as a volunteer with Corporate County Prevention Coalition. It's very difficult to teach water safety and swimming at that at that facility. There's not much room to spread out in terms of kids. The water is shallow, and it's very hard to. It's almost impossible to teach water safety here. Um, in Fort Worth, um, drowning is a leading, a leading cause of accidental death among children in Tarrant County. <coughs> Second only after car accidents. 65 children drowned in Texas in 2021. Cars Park Pool is the very last pool that is sufficiently deep to teach children to swim. I know a, a, a lot of groups, a lot of groups are using that for drowning prevention and water safety programs. The plan to replace Cars Park Pool with an interactive leisure pool will lead to more drowning deaths and more children in So um, when the Parks Department calls these their plan, uh, enhanced aquatic center, that is a euphemism that is in line with their behavior. Um, so just to repeat Hollis's comment, uh, there's some concerns about the, the redesign of Forest Park Pool not being sufficient for uh, water safety, specifically swim lessons. Uh, for our residents. And just to touch on that, on the 16th at 6.30, we will be having a, um, a, a meeting, a community meeting at the pool to go over what um, the, the current state of the pool, why it needs to be redone, and then to um, solicit that type of community feedback. We have not, and I just want to reiterate this, we have not, um, there has been no actual design of the new facility done yet. Um, so there is still opportunity for community input on what that looks like and what, what it needs. Um, I've worked really closely with Richard uh, to, to help make sure that we have all of the information that we need to give the community the pool that they want. And uh, they have gone back and they have asked consultants to give us dollar amounts on what it would look like, um, what it would cost us to add additional lap 
lanes or to add additional um, depth to that pool. Right now that pool is uh, four feet six inches in the lap lane and it would, um, in the proposed plan, it's uh, four, four foot now. So we've asked them to go back it, the, the proposed plan is four feet. The current depth of the pool is four feet, six inches in the, in the eight lap lanes. That's what's painted on the side of the pool. So, Well, in the middle, it gets deeper, deeper because there's a diving well. So, Do you want to give them the specs on the pool? Because we just went over that. So. And I, again, I don't want to bog down too much in the pool on this one because we're having a, a meeting next week. Hello, good evening. I'm Scott Penn with the Park and Rec Department. Uh, in regards to Forest Park Pool and the depths, it does begin at four and a half at the, at the start of the lap lanes, and it does go to over five feet, just over five feet in the middle, because that's where the area drain is for the pool. Yes. So you will have the opportunity to provide that kind of input um, on the 16th, and I know you might not be there because it's... It's a special day for us, but um, registered, and we'll make sure that um, that we're doing what we can to work with our community partners. And I've reached out to community partners, um, family foundations, our local uh, groups that utilize the pool to make sure that everyone that needs to be there is there and that we have all of the voices in the room so that we aren't um, taking away a facility. But I just would like to remind everybody that um, that pool is getting half a million dollars more than the pool in stop six. And this is the first bond election in which we have had an equity lens placed on how we spend. And so this is what the race and culture task force looks like at your front door. It means that we are providing the same level of service across the city. And so I think that is something that's very important to keep in mind when we're, when we're talking about this bond package. Next question. Yes, ma'am. 6.30, 6.30, yes, 6.30 at Forest Park Pool. Next question, yes. Hi, um, I'm a immigrant justice organizer in Fort Worth. Um, on the one of our meetings, I had community come and um, talk to us, and one of their biggest concerns in Fort Worth is that the city really doesn't, the lack of visibility and interest in undocumented immigrants here in the city of Fort Worth. As of 2007, there's about 475,000 of them in the DFW area. Um, they contribute about 3.1 billion in uh, combined state and local taxes, 24.4 billion in federal taxes, and as far as like budget or anything um, within the city, there's really no any uh, acknowledgement that this community exists or any benefits, despite the fact that they contribute so much money in taxes to the city. So I guess my question is, uh, what can we do to be more inclusive within the budget, but just in the city as a whole? Sure, and so I'd be interested to hear what, um, just to repeat our question, it's uh, what is the city doing in our budget to recognize the economic impact that immigrants play to our community, um, and what what have we done to, to recognize that? Uh, I think that we have often lacked in our um, appreciation of our immigrant community, not just in the city, but across the state. I'd be interested to hear um, from a city budget perspective what types of programs or what type of specific help um, you're looking for other than investment in the communities uh, that we know that those populations, um, there's a concentration of them living. And, and I can tell you from for this district, when you look at south of Barrie, which is a pretty um, good dividing line, uh, that's where you see a large portion of our uh, neighborhood street improvements and our um, a, a massive park redevelopment for Echo Lake that's gonna really uh, provide some leisure and safety for that community. Um, and so I'd be interested, just maybe offline, we can talk about what, what those type of programs look like. But one thing that I'm really proud of the city of Fort Worth for doing is um, you don't have to have an ID to get your vaccine. And we know that that is a consistent barrier to entry for our immigrant community. And so that was uh, mitigated by, uh, by our city. And so those are the types of steps that I think we're making that progress to make sure that we're more inclusive in our policy decisions. 
thing that I was concerned about is that we do have a lot of uh, rental phones for rent, um, help, and utility help. Uh -huh. And I've been trying to ask around, and I'm getting mixed answers as whether uh, people who are undocumented can get that help or not. Uh, depending on who I've asked, the answer is always very. But like I said, they contribute billions of dollars to the economy, so they should be able to get rent assistance and utility assistance as well. I try to uh, just manage the portal myself on the Fort Worth uh, City page, and it's in English only, so if anybody that might not even be an immigrant was born here but only speaks Spanish would not be able to apply for that if they didn't have a translator. Okay. So Michelle heard you that it's only in English and we can work to get it in Spanish. It's um, it's an app, it's an application that we're linked to, so we'll have to reach out and see what our options are. But um, I know we translate the material into Spanish, but I'm not sure about the portal. But I'll, I'll try yeah. to get to it. I'd love to connect and talk about it more. Than sure, and I will. Um, I'll get an answer for you specifically on those funds as to who can use them. You're welcome. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Two and then one percent of water. One percent of transportation and two percent of water. Transportation and two percent of water. Yeah. Two percent of all the rest. Like the public Water is important. Yes. Right. Oh, for the bond, sorry. Next question. No, that was last meeting. Thanks, Bob. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're talking about the bond and the budget, if you'd like to ask a question. Yeah. Do you have a comment or complaint? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I think I did want to compliment you for holding two meetings. I believe all the time you and Sal are both holding two meetings. I believe. Sal is no longer on the council. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say how I hate it I am. Yeah. But uh, that's good. You're both using, I think they should have three, if not at least two, and I do appreciate that for having two meetings. That's great. Uh, the bond thing is that the money going for the golf courses, this is the main problem I have with bond, one thing. And there are several golf courses money going through. I'd like to see it in a box by itself. Last time, they keep putting it with other things, so it kind of, it's like pork in there. Either you get the playground equipment in the Rockwood Golf Course Clubhouse and the playground equipment, or you get nothing. You know, and that was six half million dollars for a clubhouse, seven hundred and fifty thousand for playground equipment. I asked could we flip it? You know, six million for playground, seven hundred but nevertheless, if it can be done, I like all the golf courses, whatever it does with golf courses you put in a box. It's kind of misleading on the city budget when they talk about the budget and their category, they have golf courses listed as self contained. Well, if they're self-contained, that means they're making money. They should be putting money into our system, which would be good, but they should be able to pay for their own maintenance and upkeep and all that. But instead, I bet they're asking for large amounts of money for, you know, like, matter of fact, $7 million. I'm so, yeah, so to answer your question, so Bob's um, comment and question was about the money spent on golf courses for the city. So, sure. And so the golf is an enterprise fund, and right now the, um, the city is subsidizing that fund, but there is an exit plan for that so that um, that fund becomes self-sustaining and the city no longer has to subsidize that enterprise fund. So that is happening now to maintain and operate those golf courses, um, but uh, it, won't, it won't happen um, forever. But we can't put them in one box so we go to vote. So you're voting on the, on the, on the profit or the, uh, the, the bond thing. You know how you see this category, that category, so we can't put golf courses in one one box. Say yes or no. Right? It's going to go with something else, right? It's going to be it would probably part be part of the the parks. Yeah. So either we get rid of the whole group or we take it. Okay. Thank you. That's what I want to thank. Yes, ma'am. Hey, I just have a question. I sent an email to your office. Mm -hmm. You sent it to Mary from that. I sent my back to questions. Yeah. Did you get any answers from that? I was just sent over to Mr. Zavala. Nothing. Is this about the pool? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not back there. <laughs> yes, it's not. Well, just general, my general question is, what is more important for a society to have in school? We have from zero to we die to get in force. We have people from all ethnic groups 
looking at the pool. We have people with no arms, no legs. We have stroke victims. We have today we're serving and there are two heart attack victims that we're serving in the pool. What is more important for our general well-being, depression, anxiety, than having a You will not die if you can't hit a golf ball. You will not die. I think there are golfers that would probably disagree with that statement. My question is, send me back to answer. What is more important? Well, I think to you, I think to you it would be swimming, and so I appreciate your your voice in the room. I mean, I'm just generally I focus on school teacher for thirty years, and it's a question that I pose to my students. Meaning, what else? What's the second most important thing? If you, if you don't know how to do it, you will die. And I've seen people die. You say 47 people were killed by pedestrian accidents from 2015 to 2018. How many children have died? Well, we're committed to making sure that there is access to, to aquatics facilities across the, the city. That's why we, we built one in Marine. So in the 2008, and I'm, Richard could give you all, if you want a full history of what happened to our aquatics, um, you know, from 2008 when we had to start shutting them down to now, I, Richard is our um, resident historian. He can, he can give you all of the details. Um, but, but we are prioritizing aquatics facilities, and that's why we're putting one in stop six that hasn't had one before. And so um, I, I hear you. Forest Park Pool is not going away. I hear what Hollis said, that the depth of the pool needs to be looked at for adequate swim lessons. And so we'll get there, but there will be, there will be a pool there. No one's taking that away. First, or first? Well, we only have so much land. So unfortunately, that's just kind of, we have to pull the pool out before we can, can put one back in. Sure. Okay, next question. Yes. Uh, go back to your sidewalks about redoing the sidewalks. Okay. Uh, I live on Mistletoe Boulevard, older part of the neighborhood. Our sidewalks need to be redone. They came up with the money last year to put them in across the street where there were no sidewalks. Mine in front of my house needs to be done. So what are you going to do in that area, Forest Park Boulevard, Park Place, where the trees have buckled up the sidewalks and stuff like that and when you you know walk on them you could if you can't see you might trip and all that is there any fund or anything to fix the sidewalks on this side of town yes however I want to go back to the bond package and how it was created um, with the equity lens we've got folks in this district that do not have curbs and gutters And so I appreciate that your sidewalks are very important And I'm gonna have someone come out and look because it could be a matter of safety and ADA in which we could find um, the, the the Mechanism to get those sidewalks repaired, um, but again this bond package is a little different because there was a, um, a, a real emphasis placed on underserved communities and communities that needed the most. And when it comes to a safety issue, if you don't have curbs and gutters, um, sidewalks are, are, are secondary to them. Yeah. Next question. None? Okay. Oh. Sorry, um, on one of the last slides, it said uh, that there was money allocated for neighborhood improvement strategy. I'm just one, wondering what that meant. So every year, Neighborhood um, Services picks a community that they um, give about $3 million to. There's a little variance between the years, um, but they go in and they work with the neighborhood to determine what their needs are. And um, so Rosemont recently got one um, in District 9, and they, they used it for some roadway, some street and sidewalk curb improvements and Wi-Fi improvements. Um, some safety improvements, and so that's what that is. Each each year, a new neighborhood um, is given those funds. It's part of our investment in our communities. Yes. One more question: On this bond package, you're wanting the residents, homeowners, to vote on this to pay for it. What about these big corporations that are around here, like uh, Acme Brick? Uh, some of the big buildings over at Meacham Boulevard, Bell Helicopter that come in here, they come in on a tax break. 
for like five years to bring people in. And then as soon as that's up, they're gone. Page Abject was one of the companies that did that 20 years ago. So what are you doing to these big corporations that are in here to help pay for some of these bond packages, like the UP Railroad, the BNSF Railroad, the KCS? So part of our economic development package is we do offer incentives and tax breaks to, to corporations to bring jobs. We, we do that as a, as a mechanism for growth and to ensure that we don't just have jobs in this community, but we have well-paying jobs. Uh, we do structure those in a way that they are over a period of time, depending on, on the, the vehicle that we've used to give that incentive or abatement. Um, and we go back and we make sure that they are doing what they promised before um, those incentives continue. So whether it was the um, amount of income that their employees would be paid, the number of um, women or minority owned businesses that they will contract with, the number of jobs that they'll bring. Um, we go back on an annual basis and make sure that they're keeping their promise to us um, because we made a promise to them. Yes, Giles. I have something to add. Um, this is mentioned in one of the, one of the small players, compared to what she's talking about, one of the sporting exchanges came in here. They got a tax break and they paid back what they were required to when they had not hired the number of people. But they were making money every day on the money they saved by, you know, interest, investments, whatever. So what is still amounted to a tax-free or a, uh, an interest-free loan to the city for work until the time they got caught. So that only goes, that system only works so far. I hear you. Yes, sir. Just a general question. From, from the, and maybe I'm going to start with that one, but... What I heard was over the last eight years, our revenue has pretty nearly doubled what it was eight years ago. So where's the money going? Why do we need a bond issue at all? If that's a lot of extra dollars to do high tax, taxes, and everybody else. Why do we need one at all? If we've doubled our income in eight years. Because we've increased in population size and we've increased the size of the city. And so we have not doubled, but there's a lot um, there's a lot that we've done, or that we, as you can see, when Steve went through in 2014 or 2018, when we had to defer um, defer bonds, and so no one likes to pay taxes, but everyone likes city services. And so when you say that you want the best sidewalks that you can have, or you don't want congestion, um, or you want to make sure your trash is picked up on a daily basis, it costs money to, to run a city. It costs money to build and operate pools. So, um, you know, that's, that's why we're coming out. We're asking you, the residents of Fort Worth, to help us invest in making sure that this is the best community um, to live in and that we are providing the support and the services to our residents um, that are reflective of the 12th largest city in the nation. So I was correct on the that we basically doubled our revenue. David, do you know if we've doubled our, our revenue in the past eight years is what so in in this year we've actually dropped the tax rate because the assessed value has gone up and so that's I'm just saying this doesn't seem to match up when you double how much money's coming in and yet we're still on bond issue. But we're bringing, we've slowly brought down the tax rate over the years as that assessed value has gone up and we've tried to do better and do more with less as a city. We've, able, we've been able to chip away at that, that overall tax rate um, to get it to a much more manageable uh, system. Any other questions? Is there a plan on City Hall when you might be moving into the old Pier 1 building, what you might do with previous properties? It's 23 is the move in. Is 2023 the move-in date? So at the end of 2023, the new future city hall yes. should be done with construction, essentially, especially for the council chamber and things of that nature. So that's when we'll start doing the move-in. It may be in the middle of 23 by the time that's all said and done. But that's kind of what we're aiming for right now. It's subject to change, obviously, when whatever happens when we dig into that building. But yeah, so end of 23 is kind of what we think the chamber for sure will be done by then. 
So the, we'll maintain the old property. Uh, the city has uh, contracted with a uh, consultant that is going in and looking at the space that we will have in future city hall to make sure that um, we're, we're in a very deliberate way designing what that's gonna look like so we can be more efficient and more effective and we can make the user experience easier when you come to City Hall and you have a question or you need to go to different departments. And there's a lot of time and effort being spent into that and also um, what we will do with that, um, with old, current, with current City Hall. Um, and it will be, it will continue to be a, a, a city facility that, that we'll use to, to, I believe we're gonna put police in there. Isn't there discussion of the Central? Central Division, the one that's at least currently in Central and one over on Jones is also at least, and we're talking about putting those people in there so get people out of leases. Old City Hall, we can't sell. It has current, current, current City Hall. Hall. We can't sell because it's got a reverse clause of D. It goes back to the federal government, so we're going to do something with that building for sure. So as Ms. Beck has said, we're trying to do something smart, and so we have a designer for that to make sure whatever we do is something that will last another 50 years. And there's been a lot of, um, I'm really, I'm just really proud of the work that uh, Dana has done to be so deliberate about New City Hall and discussions about what our chambers were gonna look like and how we make sure it's accessible to everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about 2023 when, when we get in there. So any other questions? Hollis. Just one comment. The first gentleman said that Heritage Park was, cut, was shut down because uh, the infrastructure didn't, didn't work well. No, I was at some of the meetings that had to do with that. The Ruth Carter Stevenson and the Amy Carter Foundation help. Uh, it was shut down because homeless people were, were gathered here. And it was suddenly, that, that, that was what was said at these meetings. And so it was all, it was locked, and uh, no one allowed in, and the facility, the water was shut off. And it's because it's been, once it was shut off, then it was very hard after several years. So it's been my understanding, and I wasn't here when that uh, facility was closed, but um, it's my understanding that it was closed at the same time the water gardens were closed after the tragic accident that we had because it was a safety. There were some safety concerns about the water water pools, and work was done to, to um, remedy some of that in the water gardens, but it was not done at that, that location. And so this will... Um, give those safety measures in place so that we don't have another another water gardens tragedy at that particular location. And so, mm -hmm. any other questions? All right, I really appreciate all of you coming out tonight. I've got some action items and I'll be getting back to some of y'all and have a great evening.